Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. Let's get straight into it. This one's from uh, Rob Wills. Good on you, Rob. He's from Auckland in New Zealand. Hi to all my New Zealand viewers. Meh. <laughs> Sorry, had to make the joke. But yeah, I know Australia has more sheep than New Zealand, but you know, we can't help but call them sheep shaggers. But thank you. Let's see what uh, Rob has sent in. It was uh, crushing everything on my mailbag shelf over there. Oh, more. Hang on. So we'll get this out of the road. Jeez, it's a bit loosey goosey in the packaging, but uh, oh, ah, oh, hello, hello, ta-da! It's a projector with a couple of other miscellaneous. What's a Rev Control Smart LED Program card? I got no idea what that is. What's for programming LEDs? Oh. I don't know, and some sort of little um, power, speed controller, power brick or something. Is there a note? No. No. There's no note. By the way, if you want my hand-drawn Fluxgate condenser, uh, uh, Fluxgate condenser t-shirt, then I'll provide a link down below to the Teespring store where, if I get uh, 15, I think they will print it. Beauty. So this is an NEC VT700 projector here, um, 2008, jeez, that's pretty ancient, uh, yeah, apparently it doesn't work well, this was all sent as broken electronics, but, uh, basically it's just a PC projector, because, um, yeah, it's basically DVI and, uh, computer, no, uh, uh HDMI, sort of like, uh, TV stuff, there's our lens, and it's probably, I don't know, was this a cheapie back in the day? Not entirely sure. Push. What do I put? Oh, look. There we go. Stand. Neat. Anyway, two minute tear down. Let's go. And there's the lamp. I believe that thing is cactus. Contains mercury. Oops. Interesting lens arrangement that the uh, lamp goes through there. Hmm. There we have it. That's inside. It's quite uh, chock a block, really. Main board on the top, it's got the uh, tactile uh, buttons on the top that uh, went directly to the switches. We've got a fan over here. What brand is that? It's just some made in China thing. I don't know. Whatever. We've got a dicky little speaker on the back. Nothing fancy pantsy. Is that a... Is that a blower? Maybe? That could be a blower. I don't know. Not quite sure. I'm going to have to take this thing apart a lot more. It's actually going to require... Uh, quite a bit of effort to take this apart, so I think it's more than a two-minute uh, teardown. So I might have to leave this. If I've got enough time at the end of shooting the rest of uh, these mailbag stuff, then I'll do it. Otherwise, it'll have to be a separate video. Sorry. Reventon Smart LED Program Card. I've got no idea what this is at all, but yeah. Okay, um, interesting uh, enclosure for it. You can see the uh, dip standoff uh, four-digit LED display in there. And uh, then they've just got some buttons. Uh, looks like, are they, is that molded into the top case just going down to the tactile domes there with some switches? That, that's just a rather unusual enclosure. So all it is, some buttons, some headers, a four-digit display, and an Atmel AT Mega here, and, and a Scilabs uh, CP2102 USB uh, UART chip, and well, that's all she wrote. And, well, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. If you find a niche application that does some smart thing, you can sell a million of your widgets that, you know, are real simple to design and do. It's all a matter about market requirements. So there is, I don't know, what does this do? It programs some LEDs. Or something. Item value reset. Okay. Speed passion. I don't know. Interesting. Could have sold a million of them. Who knows? And it comes with this companion thing. The uh, speed passion. It's probably a car thing. Sort of looks and feels automotive. Took the screws off that and uh, not much uh, doing inside there. Although reasonably uh, compact. Though that's a... Yeah, that's a... That's a uh, Secondary board, so that's the that's probably the controller board. Excuse being uh, completely rough here, but some MOSFETs are driving some motors or LEDs or whatever. Actually, it makes sense that they're on the bottom side because that's the heatsink. So you want those 
MOSFETs attached down to the heatsink. So that's all this tiny little uh, controller. And, oh, okay, so you program, do you use that to program this, that other thing to program this, perhaps? Maybe that's how it works. And, oops, I could smell this before I could see it. Um, yeah, we're blowing the ass out of a few MOSFETs there. Magic smoke has escaped, active ingredient in every component. Is that part of the dye still stuck to the case inside there? Oh, wow. Extreme overload. Next up, one from Keith Williams. Thank you very much, Keith. He's from Kansas City uh, in the United States of America. Never been to Kansas. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. That's all I know of Kansas. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know that's pretty bad, but, uh, you know. Anyway. Uh, all right. Let's see what Keith sent. Got padding. We've got a note. And... Padding. That's it. Let's have a look. Da -da -da. Come on. Get out of here. Get out of here. We've got another little brick. Looks like um, some sort of regulator brick. I'm not sure if we get... Yeah, we can do a two-minute teardown on that because it looks like it's not potted. It's just a clip. It's just a clip. I can, like... Jeez, I could, yeah, I could almost get that off with my fingernail, I think. Almost. Two minute teardown. And Keith is only 15. Good on you, Keith. He's sending this little puppy. And uh, it's a DC to DC regulator for model airplanes and helicopters to regulate the main battery voltage up to 50 volts. Wow. Really? Okay, didn't think they were that high. Jeez. That's a lot of, like, multiple batteries in series? Or is there one big, like, 48 volt battery or something? Crazy. Anyway, to around six to eight, open power the receiver and the servos. Attached to the chart from the manufacturer, showing it's currently set to 6.5 volts. Me and a few friends uh, were hoping I could tear it down and tell us what I think. Maybe put it through a load test to see if it lives up to its ratings. And he wants to know if it's any good or not. Well, let's have a squiz. First thing I'm going to look at is the wires, and they look pretty beefy. Is that 16 gauge there? That looks, you know, that looks good enough to carry the current, so no worries there. But here's your problem, maximum continuous current, and Keith's given us a chart here, and I've calculated the output powers. Multiply the voltage times the current up to anywhere from 240 watts at uh, lower input voltages up to 384 watts output power capability at uh, 48 volts input with this little dicky heatsink. Are you kidding me? Um, because basically, even if you're 90% efficient, okay, you, you can, might be able to get higher than that if you optimized it for one particular output voltage, but this is a fairly wide range, right? So this is, you know, so this thing is not going to, if they get 90% efficiency in this thing, they're doing really well. 90% efficiency, you've got to, it means that you're going to be dropping 38 watts in this, anywhere from 24 watts to 38 watts in this Piss ant little heatsink here. I call bullshit right away. And I had to double check. This uh, size heatsink here, it's about 28 by 28 by 12 or something like that. We're talking about 6 degrees C per watt at a couple of hundred uh, cubic feet per minute airflow. Okay, granted, because this is on like a model plane, okay, it could be, you know, they could be getting airflow, you know, a ton of airflow over the thing. That's fine, but even that, like... You know, six degrees C per watt. Are you kidding me? And this has to dissipate anywhere from 24 to 38 watts. So at maximum power, you'd be talking well over 150 degrees C temperature rise on this thing. At, you know, under best case conditions, could be higher. It's, just, it, it's ridiculous. And there's the underside of it. At least it's got a uh, conformal coating. You should be able to see the shine on that. So they've at least gone the extra mile to uh, keep the moisture out of this thing, but come on, this is not going to do a 384 watt continuous output power. You gotta be kidding me. At least they got a 105 degree C rated cap on there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like, totally inadequate, you know, output capacitance. But, yeah, I don't know what it's, you know, it's driving, so ripple, like, you know, nah, whatever. Um, but, jeez, no, come on, come on. Anyone want to have a guess 
as to what the maximum, real maximum output power of this thing is, I don't know, probably getting towards an order of magnitude less than what they're claiming. So Keith wants to know if I give it a thumbs up. Nope. Thumbs down, um, especially for the rated power. Otherwise, you know, it, you know, it's okay if they rated this thing uh, properly. You know, it'd be fine. Okay? But hey, you know, they've done some fairly beefy parts on there, and it it's probably going to work reasonably up to a certain point. But apart from that, nah. It hasn't got a snowball's chance in hell of meeting its rating. Another one from the United States of America, uh, Andrew Turich. Thank you very much. He's from Boston, Massachusetts. Haven't been to Boston either. Jeez, I haven't been anywhere. I need to get out more. It's a bit hard when you've got a wife and two kids, though, let me tell you. Anyway, let's have a look. Oh, calculator Panasonic. Panasonic 840. Check it out. Wow, wonder how old that is. Hang on. Mid-70s. What else we got? Whoa. Oh, Palm. <laughs> hey, Palm Pilot. I've done uh, Palm Pilot teardowns before. I don't know if it was the Palm 3. Might have been. Anyway, um, I did a... I thought it was a rather good video where I did like a timeline. Compared the timeline of Palms. These were the Ducks Guts before we had these newfangled smartphones. So, anyway. Um, two minute teardown on the Panasonic. Awesome. Oh, look at this baby, the Panasonic 840, uh, 1974, apparently. I wonder how long a lifespan it actually had. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, light comes on. But uh, it's the JE 840U uh, for those playing long at home. Six volts at half a watt. Wow. Oh, I got suckered in there. That's not a let. It looked like it because I'm looking through the um, <laughs> the camcorder screen here. That's <laughs> that is not <laughs> that is not an indicator. It's just a, like a, a mechanical, like a little bit of copper or something showing through there. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Look at the styling. Andrew says that uh, this puppy does not work, so I'll take his word for it. Ah. Oh. Oh, 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 is that a header? Yeah, you betcha that's a header. Oh, wow, look at that. There we go. Oh, look at, oh, look at that vacuum fluorescent display. Oh, thing of beauty. <laughs> look at those white, are they? They're jumpers. They're white jumper links, through hole jumper links. Anyway, it's a Matsushidu. There you go. MN 5530. What's the calculator forensics on this puppy? can't do it because it doesn't have any trig functions. It's just, as they're called in the trade, a four banger. It's not a real display unless it's got a nipple. Look at that. I love the nipple. Next up we have a commercial one. You can tell because it's FedEx. Uh, Joe Average usually doesn't do FedEx unless you're in one of those countries that can get a really good deal on FedEx. Certainly not Australia. Anyway. Dun, dun, dun. Jeez, this thing's a bit unwieldy. Anyway. Yeah, struggle through with it because it looks good. It's all a bit something's come out. It's got something long. Light. Interesting. Oh. Oh, I think I might like this. Doll. Oh, it turns out I actually ordered um this. Um oh, I completely forgot. I order stuff and just completely forget about it. But apparently, um, they knew who I was. Hi Dave, we really like the EEV blog. Uh, we included some extra sample goodies, OPV tape, solar cell sticky tape. Enjoy, Infinity PV. There you go. That's the logo, Inf Infinity. Yes, Infinity PV. There you go. Thank you very much. D doesn't say. Anyway, they enjoy my blog. Thank you very much. These are organic solar cells. Wow, I'm going to have to do a separate video on these. I can't do these justice in the mailbag, I don't think. But uh, yeah, these are flexible organic solar cells. Ah, oh, very excited. It's a whiz-bang new technology. And uh, now I can't remember why I ordered I ordered them because they're cool, but I wanted to... I can't remember if I had a specific idea for it. Either video idea or project idea or both. Uh, at, at the time, and yeah, these are um, flexible uh, 3M backing tape on them. Anyway, let's take a look. Awesome, 
flexible organic solar cells. Beauty. Hang on. Oh, I just love the genuine 3M adhesive smell. Oh. Oh, I'm quite excited about these. I'll show you in better uh, detail in a minute. But I've got a couple of these Infinity uh, PV uh, test samples. What they are, and uh, strips as well, but these ones are kind of like more useful. They're designed for uh, like classroom uh, demonstrators and things like that. And yes, they are completely flexible. Solar cells like this, no worries, these would have adhesive uh, strips on the back. You can stick them in uh, various places, you can cut them to length. And what they are, is they're organic solar cells. The most important thing about these is that they're actually printed. Uh, they're printed photovoltaic technology, so they print them on these uh, large format roll printers. So they print them on like rolls that are you know, like hundreds of meters long or something like that. So you're going to print them as long as you like, and you just cut them, uh, you just cut them to size, to length, uh, to the ones that you, you require. So the manufacturing cost of these things is incredibly low. Or I should correct that and say, has the potential to be incredibly low. I'm not sure what the uh, uh, cost is at the moment, probably high because they're still not, you know, not real mainstream technology. But the fact that you can um, uh, print these on really cheap uh, printers instead of, you know, solar cell manufacturing is quite, a, you know, the regular ones that you're used to on your rooftops and things like that, they're, you know, quite an evolved uh, process. And these are not terribly efficient, by the way. We're only talking 1.5 to 7% percent uh, efficiency as opposed to you know like maybe 20 percent efficiency for like a rooftop uh, solar panel but the fact that you can actually print these on roll printers uh, and they're uh, thin completely like uh, less than 0.5 millimeters flexible bend bendable semi-transparent you can get them different funky colors excellent um, and you can get uh, uh, any length limit as I said and even the production of them is energy efficient uh, you don't need any high uh, power, high uh, temperature uh, processes, uh, no vacuums, no uh, evaporation uh, type you know, processes, no clean rooms, nothing like that. Uh, it uses an additive manufacturing uh, technology, fast energy payback time. I, you'd probably, I'll link in the website down below. They've probably got uh, a more detail and low environmental impact, non-toxic or no scarce elements or anything like that. Well, they claim to be uh, recyclable, um, probably not 100%, but, you know, you can probably do it. And here's the uh, solar foil, which I don't have. Uh, these ones are efficiency only 2 to 4%. Not great, but hey, they could offer more uh, bang per buck. So you wouldn't use these in, you know, massive solar farm projects or something like that. But uh, hey, for, you know, if they're really low cost and flexible and you can use them in all sorts of different uh, scenarios, you can't use traditional solar cells in, then they could be a winner. Uh, typically one to four watts per meter. That'll depend on the width. I guess they send sell uh, different width uh, types. Uh, you can cut, connect and integrate them yourself and uh, they can have the adhesive on the back, just like this, and oh, I love the smell of the 3M adhesives. Oh, it's just wonderful. And we don't have these here, but uh, Infinity uh, PV looks like they do uh, some like test systems and things like this. Uh, laser beam induced current mapping. So they actually use here's a uh, little block diagram. They use a uh, te PC based. Uh, test system, hook it up, and then they've got a scanning laser here, can scan over the solar cell, and um, you can induce the current in there, so to map it out, and to 100% characterize the surface, the surface of these things. That's pretty neat. And they've even got a solar simulator as well. Hey, that's pretty, it generates a homogeneous light uh, simulation over a large area with uh, various filters and uh, all sorts of stuff to uh, test your Solar panels, fantastic. So here's the classroom demonstrator. They've got these uh, studs here, fantastic. Positive and negative terminals. Uh, AG, no recycling. So there's, uh, of course, they've got um, silver in these things. Silver is a big uh, usage, high usage component in uh, regular solar panels. They'll be using those for the uh, contacts and things like that. But yeah, this is going to, I presume it's only like a two layer process. I can't like tear it down or anything like that. Presumably, you have to shine them on the uh, top surface like that, or do you also get, I, maybe you wouldn't get the same efficiency, but maybe you can shine it from the other side. Anyway, these are really jazzy. You can fold them like this. Fantastic. Oh, 
All right, let's measure the uh, short circuit current, shall we? This is an easy uh, test for uh, solar uh, panels. You can't uh, damage them by doing this, not just these ones, other ones as well. Measure the short circuit uh, current, and we're looking with the lab lights here. I've got about a thousand lux on the uh, bench here, and we're getting about 500 microamps. There you go. And can we, yeah, we can just shield out one of them, and it will slowly decrease. Yep, there you go. Linear decrease, pretty much. Yep, yep, happy with that. Nice. And unfortunately, I can't take it outside and test it because, well, it's, uh, yep, 6 p.m. So what happens if I flip that over? There we go. You still get something out of it, but, uh, yeah, as I suspected, uh, not as good as efficiency. Basically, it drops in half when you uh, get light from the other side, but they're semi-transparent. That's why it works. Yeah, if I shine a torch onto this thing, wham. We're overloaded. I have to go to milliamps. Oh, five, seven milliamps. Look at that. What a Bobby Dazzler. Oh, geez, you might be able to get 10 milliamps out of that by shining a torch on it. So anyway, I think these are really jazzy. I'm going to experiment with these. Probably maybe I'll actually uh, have, a have a play around and fully characterize this in a separate video. But I'll link them in down below. They're infinitypv.com. Very jazzy and very promising technology too. this, um, you know, like basically additive printing technology to print solar cells. Fantastic. Not hugely efficient yet, but hey, they'll probably get better. I think it's probably unlikely that they're ever going to match uh, proper, in quote marks, you know, the real high efficiency uh, solar technology that we used to these days. And that's just growing and growing and growing. I think these ones are always going to be less efficient by the nature of the printing processes and, you know, things like that. They're, they're not as optimized, uh, but they're designed for low cost and, you know, easy manufacturing. And also it's the, as they talked about, the um, ecological footprint of actually manufacturing these things is going to be a hell of a lot lower. So you'd have to go through the whole life cycle analysis of how much energy is required, overall energy required to produce a regular rooftop panel, uh, for example, you know, a poly, polycrystalline panel or whatever, compared to an equivalent output of a printed one like this. And, you know, look at the, do the whole life cycle, which is a complex thing. That's, you know, manufacturing the raw materials, mining them and transporting them and processing them and then transporting them again. And then the manufacturing process of the panel itself and then shipping, you know, testing and shipping everything else. So life cycle analysis is quite uh, complex. So it'd be interesting if anyone actually has any data on that of these compared to uh, regular uh, photovoltaics then please let us know anyway these are fun I have to do another video on these great ourselves another FedEx jobby, extremely urgent, um, FedEx Express. <laughs> Sorry, it's been sitting here forever. Um, this is from uh, Siligo, um, Siligo, as I like to call them. Um, I think they're having a second or third suck of the salve. They've been on here before, so let's test this. Uh... Oh, worked, look at that. Marvelous modern technology, and we've got, yep, a couple of little chippies and boards. Let's take a look. And I'm sure we've seen these on the blog before. They're having a second suck of the SAV. These are, uh, I'll show you the data sheet here. These are a mixed signal, uh, for want of a better word, a mixed signal PLD, uh, really. Like, uh, they've got like uh, macro cells like uh, PLDs, uh, but, or, you know, slash FPGAs. You know, they've got some serial comms in there. They've got analog comparators. They've got filters and things like that. And you can 
switch them all in. Neat little niche use uh, components. And check out what they've sent me here because these are such little bastard packages. You can't possibly use them. This is a uh, zero insertion force socket. Uh, converts the chips into a little uh, dual inline 0.1 inch header. Very nice, but look at how small this is. Yeah, that's... Can you see the pins in there? Can you see them? Can you see them? You might have to watch this in like full HD to be able to see the pins in that. What a bastard package. But hey, obviously their target market is, you know, real dense uh, stuff. So the packages are what they are. So uh, this is a really nice to get the adapter like this to be able to, uh, you know, breadboard play around with these things um, at the prototype level. Awesome. So oh, if you want to take a look at them, I'll link them in down below. We got one from Germany. Hi to all my German viewers uh, from Arn. Yeah, Arn. Weasel. Weasel. Wessel. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, from Herzberg in Germany. I don't know what Herzberg is. Got some nice flower stamps on here. Beauty. Um, it says electronic component. Yeah, that narrows it down. I think I can just uh, slice and dice that. Let's have a look what art. Oh, that looks like a dongle. That looks like a dongle. Old school. You remember those? When <laughs> you plug them onto your uh, parallel or serial port and you would enable. Uh, software and uh, stuff like that. Geez, I designed one back in the day for somebody. Oh, wow. Anyway, let's have a look at the note. Greetings from the Haas in Germany. Um, as announced by, oh yes, email. Yes, I think he uh, said he was going to um, send this dongle. Maybe a two minute teardown if it's not potted. So Arnie has sent through this Sentinel Super Pro dongle. Let's see if we can take it apart. Oh, anyone remember these? What's it for? It was software licensing at his father's company. He doesn't say. I assume that software... Yeah, yeah, it does. It basically looks for the presence of the dongle. This is how they copy protected software back in the day. They used... Uh, what was that? Is that Rainbow something or other? So that's the company. And Sentinel Super Pro would be the dongle. And there were dongle companies back in the day. I'm sure there's... Uh, None of them still around, made in the Philippines. I don't know if it was in the Philippines. Well, there's an anti-climax. We've just got a chip on board blob. And that's basically it. Some of the lines are straight through. Um, this is designed to plug into the uh, parallel port, of course. And uh, they were all the rage back in the 80s. Parallel port dongles. I can remember um, Altium, which was uh, called Protel at the time. That was their official name. They used to have a dongle for their Autotrax uh, software version 1.61, and then uh, which was Autotrax for DOS. Yes. DOS, Microsoft MS-DOS, thank you very much, real operating system, um, and they had a version 1.61, I can remember when 1.61 ND came out, and ND stood for no dongle, so it no longer required the dongle, you could just copy the software, and Bob's your uncle, you've got it. So I don't know, maybe someone out there has details on this particular one, whether or not it was encrypted or did anything fancy like that. It was probably just simple. And I designed one of these uh, back in the day, and no, it was it didn't use encryption or anything like that. A common technique was just to use, you know, basically jelly bean uh, logic, shift registers and stuff like that, and you can just uh, encode the data, and then you potted the thing, and yeah, you could reverse engineer it, but yeah, most people didn't bother. There was no internet back then, you you know, so it was like, you know, people couldn't you know, just commonly share the knowledge or whatever if you did uh, reverse engineer it. So, you know, just a simple, uh, you know, uh, jelly bean logic way of uh, uh, doing it, just shifting out some hidden bits or something. If they didn't, if the correct bits didn't come out, then, you know, boom, that was it. it the software just wouldn't work. And from memory, it was actually difficult to uh, circumvent these in software because uh, most of the software back in the day would talk to the serial port hardware directly. So intercepting that and just, you know, feeding in the correct data or doing whatever, if you, you know, you could sniff it uh, to see, you sniff the pins, get a logic analyzer in there, see what it's doing. Um, but to actually, you know, duplicate that, I, I think most people probably duplicate in hardware back in the day. Jeez, that's really stretching my memory now. Bloody dongles. I've got a letter, old school letter from MB. It's even typed. It's from a typewriter. Brilliant. Um, a stamp from the Seska 
Republica? Is that like the Czech Republic or something? Seska. There you go. Can you see that? Huh. Anyway, let's open it. Old school letter. Tight. Doesn't get any better. Geez, those were the days. I can remember when I was selling kits and and software back in the day when I was a we youngster and um yeah people would send me letters or i got my articles published people would send me letters probably still have a lot of them lying around and so i got a oh a postcard or oh no they're photos they're photos excellent from oh i love the clock oh i'm a big fan of clock towers ah, it's not just because of back to the future oh i really like uh loves when i debunk stuff like the batterizer yep brilliant um you really disappointed me on the 833 video when you talked about faith. <laughs> what? Oh, God. Why Jesus? Why not Allah? Why not? Oh. Anyway, it was the Czech Republic, and oh, it's a gorgeous clock tower. Where is that? Oh, wow. I love that. Beautiful. Oh, I don't make them like that anymore. Now, I know some people think this is off topic and I shouldn't even bother with this, but hey, this is the mailbag segment. I open the mail and I talk about what's in it. Somebody has sent me a letter about religion and, uh, in fact, my previous uh, comment on it, which they're uh, taking uh, exception to. Um, it's, uh, he's disappointed. Um, mailbag 883, I presume it is, or whatever 883 was. I'm talking about legitimate concern, opinion. I am a disappointed because you totally screwed up with logic. Okay, let's see where I was wrong. I was not expecting something like this from you. Do you want to base your life on science? Yes, of course I do. Well then start with logic first. Okay, I am referring to these exact words you said. Why Jesus? Why not Allah? Why not Buddha? Why not anyone of the, you know, hundreds or even thousands of gods that have been worshipped over the years by people who believe just as much as you do and they can't all be right. So it is almost certain that, well, none of them are right. And that's exactly, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what I uh, said in a video a while back. If there was a bullshit meter, you would blow up the protection fuse with this sentence. Here we go. Here's his logic. Let's go through it. Okay. I'll give it a fair suck of the salve. Let's assume you have 2,000 kids in a school and you ask them how much is 6 plus 9. All 2,000 kids will give you a different answer. Okay, well, if they don't know what that is, okay, fair enough. There are hundreds, thousands of kids saying something different, and they can't all be right. So it is almost certain that none of them are right. Correct? Well, that is exactly what you said. No, it's not. This is the most piss-poor analogy I've ever heard in my life, because this is a question about mathematics. It has a 100% certified certifiably demonstrably true answer so you can it, it, of course i would not say none of them are right i would in this instance of course i would not say none of them are right so right there the analogy is completely and utterly busted it's it's the worst analogy i've ever heard of course, there is a kid who is right among these 2,000 kids. Surprisingly, the only kid who says when, the fact that uh, 1,999 kids gave the wrong answer does not imply that the only kid answering is also wrong. Of course, I never said I was not implying that. Unbelievable. Nor does it reduce the probability that there is actually somebody who is right, how he's right, who is right. Of course, because these are, this is apples and oranges. You cannot compare these two. It is a fundamentally demonstrably bad analogy. Kid 15, is it? I5 is not less or more probable to be right because, uh, because around him there are more or less kids agreeing or disagreeing with him. The same applies when you talk about gods. I'm glad you brought that up. I completely agree. And I, I've probably said that many times before. Uh, the fact that there might be a billion other people who believe the same thing you do does not make it true. It's only evidence that makes something true. The same applies when you talk about gods. Yes, there are thousands of gods worshipped around the world. That does not imply almost none of them is right. Uh, they could all be wrong, but there could be one who is right. Both options are logically valid. You cannot logically say that disagreement implies nobody is right. You do not have any freaking logic base to state so. 
I'm sorry to tell you this, Mattia, but that is not how it works. Let's assume that there are nine gods, okay? That people believe in nine different gods, and then the tenth option is there is no god. They are not all equally valid because the nine gods not only have absolutely no evidence for going for them, but they're all contradictory. Okay, They're, they all hold contradictory statement, contradictory statements, which means that they can't, you know, like two of them can't be true, right? So at best, only one of them is true, but because they contradict each other, and that alone is in effect evidence that they're actually all made up. They're, it's actually evidence. So the option, the tenth option, that there is no God actually has some evidence behind it, as opposed to the other nine who are all contradicting each other and have no real verifiable evidence whatsoever. So the ninth option that there is, the tenth option that there is no God is does not have the same probability as one of the other nine being true. There's not one chance in 10 of there being no God, or there's not one chance in 10 of the Christian God being true. Uh, for example, whatever flavor of the hundreds of different flavors of Christianity you want to pick, that's not how it works. The lack of evidence does not sit on the same level of probability as evidence. It's just not how it works. Sorry, Madia. That is one of the worst analogies I've ever heard. But hey, it's a common one from religious people. Eh, go figure. So what is more probable? That the religion that you believe in, that you were just by accident, happened to have been born into in a particular country and raised up in a particular faith, that that one happens to be actually true when there's absolutely no evidence for it, when there's hundreds or even thousands of other religions or variations of religions that all have different viewpoints and contradictory viewpoints with absolutely no evidence for any of them. And you're trying to assert that they're all, you know, logically the same probability? No, it's absurd. And this one I already opened because I thought it was a letter uh, some time back, actually. I think I might have uh, tweeted it, actually. Um, it's a letter from a lawyer, um, some legal firm here in Australia. And, you know, when you first see it, like you open a letter oh, from a lawyer. Oh, God, what have I said now that's got me in trouble? Who's suing me? Um, no, they want me to be an expert uh, witness on a case. And no thanks. No way, Jose. And I get these things at least a couple of times a year. Um, they sent me an email as well. I've already uh, replied to them, but they sent me a formal letter as well. And no, I turned down all these expert witness cases. It's just not worth the trouble. It's, you know, unless you're really, unless it was something massively high, high profile, like it was, the, you know, the Toyota uh, case with, you know, the accelerator pedal thing or something, you know, something really important. But this is just some tin pot company here about their soldering alleged defects. I'll show you it. Alleged defects in soldering light assemblies, the misters. Like, I don't want to get bogged down in that. Yeah, and they often say, oh, we'll give you a handsome retainer for your time and effort. No, nah, it's not worth your time and effort. So here's one of these typical letters that I get quite a few of. Some of the key issues essential to the dispute relate to aspects of alleged defects of control boards, soldering, light assemblies, thermistors, and driver boards. Our client has become aware of your expertise. Yeah, they've just Googled, you know, PCB or circuit expert or something. I don't know, my, maybe my name came, came up on the list. Jeez. Well, the timeline of litigation requires that a draft report be completed by the end of March. We're, this is an old letter. And therefore, uh, seeking to brief you in the matter, blah, 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 end of February, blah, 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 my CV, blah, 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 blah. No thanks. My advice, don't get involved in these things. They're just not worth your time and effort. Getting through some older ones just stuck at the back at the bottom there. Sorry if you've been sitting. Some of them are like many, many months they've been sitting here. Anyway, it doesn't say who it's from, so uh, person unknown. I think it's Norway. So hi to all my Norwegian viewers, assuming that's correct. Wait. 
I have a couple of parts. Greedy, uh, just a greeting from Norway. Got it right. Uh, very much appreciate your work. Thank you very much. You managed to inspire even a biologist to familiarize himself with electronics, which is impressive. Thank you very much. Awesome. Love hearing that sort of stuff. Included our three pairs of Formula and banana plug adapters that I find very practical. Oh, that's handy. That's handy. Okay. They're, um, they're uh, pins to go stick them in your breadboard to banana jacks. I don't actually have any of those. They're damn handy. You know, I normally do it in a, in a um, he's made him himself, obviously. Still don't say who you are, but thank you very much. Um, very handy. I normally, you know, just have a bit of wire sticking up and then I might have a uh, alligator clip lead to something else, you know, that I just clip on. And it's, it's daggy, but that's nice to connect up to probes or power or anything like that. That's really handy. And we've got an old Altera PLD. Wow, that's old school. And LH0033. What's that? LH0033. Is that a high speed, um, like a real high speed amp? I can't remember. Damn, memory. Getting too old. There you have it. These things are coming real handy. Make your own. Easy peasy. Highly recommended. Wow, an early Altera EP910 EPLD, a raisable programmable uh, logic device. Basically, 24 macro cells inside this thing, and here's a shot of uh, the macro cells and what they actually contain. A typical uh, early reconfigurable uh, PLD logic, electrically erasable um, in this case, which was a uh, uh, fantastic boon at the time. You didn't have to worry about any of that UV erasing rubbish. Fantastic. And the LH0033. Well, can you still buy it? Um, but yeah, this thing was the duck's guts for a long time, if it isn't still the duck's guts. Anyway, um, a high current, uh, wide bandwidth, high voltage uh, amplifier. Very handy, very widely used in all sorts of you know, a more high power uh, applications. It's basically just a real high power voltage buffer. That's it. It's not an amplifier, just a buffer. Hi to all my Canadian viewers. This one's from Nicholas Gonthia. Thank you very much, Nicholas. He's from uh, Drummondville, QC. Where's QC in Canada? I'm not sure. It's not Quebec, is it? No. Anyway, let's see what Nicholas has sent. There's some postcards. They'll be nice because it's Ta -da. It is the snow, all that funny white stuff, which we don't get here. Yes, we do. Uh, up in the snowy mountains, there's like a couple of places in Australia where it snows regularly. And uh, yes, Quebec. There you go. Beautiful. Oh. Anyway, what's in here? Something tiny. We'll take a look. And Nicholas has sent in a classic here. I don't have one of these. It's a nine. To, well originally introduced in 1961 let's take it out here to protect the pins ta-da one of the first commercially available ICs look at that oh it looks like a lunar lander it's got too many legs but you know little spidery craft coming down land on the moon oh we're almost out of gas Boom. Anyway, he got these from a science teacher while he's in high school, and his dad owned the local TV repair shop, got a bunch of surplus uh, parts, and yeah, 1961 vintage RTL, resistor transistor logic, none of this TTL rubbish, or diode transistor logic, just transistors and resistors, and uh, apparently these were used in the um, Apollo guidance computer, oh, that's Luckily, I did the, I looked like a limb. There you go. The Apollo guidance computer. Um, they used uh, some of these, uh, Fairchild stuff. The, um, used 2800 uh, micro logic. There you go. Dual Norgate IC to create the first computer. The computer was running at 2 megahertz, 16 bit, consumed 55 watts and weighed only 32 kilograms. That was like stunning for the day and allowed us to land on the moon. Fantastic. Anyway. Fantastic. Here's the original data sheet for this thing, and you can see the uh, it's got resistors and transistors in it. That's it. Uh, this is the dual input um, uh, to input uh, NOR gate. There we go. Uh, typical resistor values, uh, 450 and 640 ohms. There you go. Wow. Terrific. But these things were, you know, state of the art back in the day, because you would have had to have your four transistors and all your resistors. So this 
saved a lot of space. This was, you know, state-of-the-art integration at the time. Oh, sorry, this one actually contained a dual two-input uh, NOR gate. So we had two NOR gates inside the one package. There it is. Um, and it can fan out uh, to 16 other... Uh, it could drive 16 other devices. That wasn't too shabby. Even today. Jeez, 16 devices. Pretty good. And you can wire them as RS flip-flop. And I'd love to power this puppy up and give it a bell, but unfortunately I don't have time. i got to race through the rest of this mailbag. We're back to Germany again. Thank you very much, Alexander Nassian um, from Lossach in Germany. Don't know where it is. Sorry. Let's have a look. Ah, no. Nah. One of these stupid tricky thing. Oh, goodness. Fail. Fail, 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 fail. It's got wire wrapped around. So soldering iron. Oh my. Ugh. I feel dirty. Oh no. And why do we have wire wrapped in here? I've got to undo... That's not wire. I think that's solder. Probably the good lead stuff. And Alexander has sent in the soldering iron of death. I'm pretty sure we've seen one of these before, haven't we? Shocking. Uh, this is a 220-240 uh, <laughs> volt 60 watt unit. And wow, I mean, it costs $2.00. 40, including shipping from Hong Kong. I mean, unbelievable. Look at that. There's no strain relief at all. That is the worst quality feeling cable I've ever felt in my entire life. It is truly horrendous. And if we <laughs> like, and it, it's just, ah, oh, it's dicky as. Unbelievable. If we open it up. Oh, and there, yep, there we go. Oh, main straight into the element, no earthing on your metal. Unbelievable. Do not use these things. These are just, they literally are a death trap, I think. Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. And once again, there are some people watching me live on this one. There's my little uh, Logitech C920 webcam and... I'm using, uh, I'm broadcasting to my second channel, EEV Vlog uh, 2. Link is down below at all. There's not, nothing else. There's just a single custom ASIC chip, which they turn out for peanuts once they've got their, um, once they've paid for the um, engineering on that. 